of the system. Um, the second reason is that in such new and highly var variable, volatile political situations, electoral behavior is relatively unpredictable. We, we only need to remember the sudden explosion of Syriza's electoral influence back in May uh, of uh, 2012. Uh, when we first uh, came to um, uh, talk we about Greece, this report, sure. Yes, uh, no one could see um, this explosion of Syriza back in 2012 uh, coming. Uh, what could be seen, and is also seen right now, let me tell you, and this is my main point. Um, if someone looks closely enough at the polls. It's a huge pool of undecided voters who that polls um, um, used are used to ignore. And in these highly volatile situations, both economically and politically, no one can really foresee what undecided voters will choose when they actually find themselves, you know, in front of the ballot box. Right. So... May, uh, in 2012, we saw Syriza. Uh, maybe this year we will see, I don't know, uh, this uh, popular unity, the new uh, left of the left. <laughs> and um, maybe we'll see something to the far right. I don't know. I'm afraid of it. But we, we, need, to, we, we need to see what's, what's going, what's, what will happen. In, actually, in um, uh, Weimar, Germany, I don't think anyone could expect such an explosion of the Nazis. I, I, I hope that we don't see something like this, but you see my point. Now, look, uh, Michael, the, one of the main points is there's got to be a, a political party which says no to austerity under any circumstances, because otherwise the golden dawn will pose. It will fake uh, trying to fulfill that role. And that's, of course, that's what happened in Germany, right? That the, yeah. the Social Democrats wouldn't fight for the workers and the Nazis claimed that they would. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is correct. And this national, this national unit, this um, popular unity party is trying, they are trying to be an anti-austerity front. That is the main issue here. That it, 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 they they try to use the the word front. We are a front, not a, par not a party in the narrow sense, but a front of all people who want uh, uh, to end austerity by all means, even if we need to get out of the eurozone. Exactly. This, this is they are trying. They are beginning to. Um, uh, take uh, other parties, small parties of the left wing, with them. Uh, also, um, who who also want to return to a return of the drachma to the drachma, uh, and that's a respectable <laughs> opinion, a respectable strategy. But what another question is that many people um, are maybe ask maybe asking is what what the hell is Cyprus doing? Um, and I need to say two words about this. What Tsipras thinks that he's doing here is saving Europe. That's my view. The, the, there was a so-called, in these talks, in this negotiation, there was a so-called Schäuble plan that reportedly um, had an, a per, um, temporary euro exit for Greece, plus, and that's the important point that uh, no one uh, has... Uh, to, uh, no one has uh, spoke about this, is a tighter fiscal oversight of the rest of the Eurozone. In other words, a, re a reshuffling, a political reshuffling of the Eurozone to impose even tighter measures and tighter austerity and with some kind of fiscal oversight, direct fiscal oversight of the Eurozone on... I think we've, uh, we've seen newspaper reports this week that uh, Brussels is calling for a European, a pan-European finance ministry. Yes, something like that, right. which, of course, Germany will control. And I think that Cyprus is trying to um, fight in these terms for Europe. He's not trying to, to, to be... He's trying not to be chauvinist, just to think like European. I absolutely respect both strategies, let me tell you. What I'm afraid 
is what will happen in the meantime when you try to save Europe and Golden Dawn, you know, uh, blows up in your face. That's that's my concern. And Michael, one one thing that occurred to me this week is we had a we had a, a whiff of panic in the world on uh, what Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday between China and Europe and the U.S. If uh, somebody in Greece had come forward at the height of that panic and say, "Guess what? We're gonna we're gonna say all bets are off," and at the height of the crash, right when China is right. crashing and Europe is crashing and the U.S. is crashing, say, "Now we want to negotiate." Because now you know that if we leave, your whole system will come crashing down. Yeah, but you know, you need to have some <laughs> leverage, and you need to to you to believe in uh, Greece's leverage. But the, um, I'm afraid that a very weak government that we had uh, couldn't do something like this. We need a we need a strong government somehow, some kind of a strong anti-austerity government. And we need to see how things play out from now on. Okay, and we will, week to week, right? Because we want to keep following this. This is the most advanced laboratory to see you know, things that are going to be happening in other countries. Thank you, Michael. We'll see you next week. Welcome to the second hour of World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. So we are... Looking now at a complex series of events around international diplomacy, the Russian attempt to start an anti-ISIS coalition and use that then to, to beat down the pro-terrorist tendencies and activities of Saudi Arabia and Turkey in particular. The U.S., we've got special envoy for Syria, Ratney, Michael Ratney in Moscow and going on to other capitals, and therefore we're uh, interested in the diplomatic aspect. But then parallel to that, inside the United States, we've also got this question of the reworking, the cooking, the massaging, the faking of the intelligence involving the efficacy of the U.S. campaign against ISIS. And again, this is a cover story. It's a way to cover and camouflage a policy of, a, of appeasement and phony war. So the idea is you got to pretend that you're attacking ISIS, but you don't really attack them because you want to have ISIS to use against Iran and Russia. And this is summed up in this odious individual, a General Allen, who has to be fired. OK, you want to get it. You want to get a good result of this uh, diplomacy. Get rid of Allen. Dump Allen. Hashtag fire Allen for ISIS. It's getting to be the end of the month, uh, whether it's August or September, Allen must go. Now, here we have, uh, in particular, the New York Times. Uh, once again, Mark Mazzetti and Matt Apuzzo, inquiry weighs whether ISIS analysis was distorted August 25th, 2015. So what do we find here? Allen leading the charge of distorters, the distorter in chief, the top faker, the main intelligence cooker and massager is the ISIS czar Allen, retired General John Allen. Here we read in the New York Times, the article I just mentioned, in late July, retired General John Allen, who is Mr. Obama's top envoy working with other nations to fight the Islamic State, told the Aspen Security Forum that the terror group's momentum had been, quote, checked strategically, operationally, and by and large, tactically, close quotes. Allen goes on to say, ISIS is losing. This is Allen a month ago in Aspen, Colorado. ISIS is losing, he says, even the New York Times notes, as he acknowledged that the campaign faced numerous challenges from blunting the Islamic State's message to improving the quality of Iraqi forces. Notice now, Ash Carter, Ash Carter, the new Pentagon boss, uh, during a news briefing last week, Carter, Ash Carter, was more measured. He called the war difficult, and it's going to take some time. But he added, I'm confident that we will succeed in defeating ISIL because we have the right strategy. Well, Will you, in fact, succeed? Here's the problem. 
two things happened on the ground this week. One is we have this area. It's about 60 to 70 miles. It stretches along the Turkey-Syrian border. It starts more or less at the Euphrates River. When the great Euphrates River crosses that border, that's kind of a, a dividing line. And from there, 60 to 70 miles towards the west, we have the safe zone. We have argued it's a safe zone for terrorists. And lo and behold, that's what it's turning out to be. Here's the way it works. First of all, ISIS is gaining in the, pro uh, the uh, province of Aleppo, Syria. So the fact that the Kurds have not been allowed to close that stretch of border, the Kurds have not been allowed to cut the ISIS supply line, let them wither on the vine. Per Kurds prevented by whom? By Erdogan and his, his sidekick, Allen, here in Washington. The ISIS gains are mounting in the Aleppo province of Syria with reports of heavy fighting overnight in which they routed the Free Syrian Army, uh, taking over several villages and approaching the strategically important town of Marea, which is now a key base for FSA forces. The FSA forces, of course, are a joke. And we have this thing called Division 30 of uh, U.S. trained moderate terrorist rebels. I'm sorry. It's not Division 30. It's Platoon 30. It's a good-sized platoon. That's it. Not a division. So the capture, we now read, I'm reading from antiwar.com. The capture is doubly inconvenient for the U.S. and Turkey, as they have not only been backing the Free Syrian Army, which is myth mythological, in this region, but the area was a key part of the 60-mile safe zone that the uh, U.S. and Turkey were intending to carve out of northern Syria, which is supposed to be ISIS-free. <laughs> it's less ISIS-free than ever, writes the uh, witty correspondent here. Less ISIS-free than ever. That is the fault of the U.S. and Turkey. And Allen, I would say, Allen and Erdogan, as this territory was under the control of al-Qaeda earlier in the month. So the idea is that the area that is now included, this area... It's this kind of a triangle from the place where the Euphrates crosses the Turkish-Syrian border over to Aleppo and then north. That's sort of what it looks like. Uh, that area was, it had been, had been under the control of the Nusra Front. In other words, good old Al-Qaeda, I guess these people would say. Al-Qaeda, bad enough. But what then happened was the Nusra Front said to Erdogan, OK, Erdogan, we understand uh, you want this to be a safe zone, so we'll get out of here, right? We're going we're gonna to leave. We're going to abandon this territory because we, we understand that's what Erdogan wants. And, of course, Erdogan is happy because as soon as the Nusra got out of there, ISIS piled in and they, they steamrolled the so-called Free Syrian Army, this mythological construct. And now the entire safe zone is safely in the hands of the terrorists from ISIS, the worst butchers and uh, savages that the world has seen in recent years. OK, so there it goes. ISIS is taking over the territory and they're generally gaining because of this uh, attempt to provide air cover for them. Right? This is an area where it's very hard for the Syrian Arab Air Force to go in and clobber them, which otherwise is what would happen, because they're under the protection of various kinds of air defenses provided by the U.S., by Turkey, and so forth. So uh, you get the idea. This is a disaster. This is where Allen's strategy has, uh, has brought us. Now, let's just look at one or two other items, because where does this all lead, you may well ask? We have the London Observer here somewhere, uh, and the London Observer is uh, pointing out that there are more cries now to send military forces in there. Uh, actually, we'll get to we'll get to the London uh, the, the London Observer in a minute. Here, Philip Giraldi, right, old CIA. Fine, we know. How Turkey Plays the War on Terror. This is an interesting study. This is done in the American Conservative. Hey, 
Gold is where you find it. So uh, August 25th, 